Hi, everyone, and welcome to Classical Stuff You Should Know. We're a podcast about old books, old ideas, old art, old stuff, and we are aiming to bring that stuff to you in the most painless way possible. My name is AJ Hannenberg, and I'm here with my compatriots, Graham Donaldson. Hi. And Thomas Magby. Hi. And we all work at a classical school in Austin called Veritas Academy. And we are all highly prejudiced. Uh, <laughs> most most of our episodes are just us bringing up a topic and then just bagging on it real hard. Oh my gosh! And uh, and you know what? We're proud about that. Oh, we're very proud. We got a yeah. lot of pride. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, we just like to bag on stuff. Yes, it's true. What what are we bagging on today, Graham? Um, Hamlet. No, I'm <laughs> <laughs> we've we've done that twice already. I'm pretty sure. Hamlet. Yeah. Oh, well, Hamlet. Done? He may make an appearance simply because he's going to add a little coda to our conversation hey, today. There you go. Um, but yeah, we're going to talk a little bit on Pride and Prejudice. We'll do kind of like a little intro to the book, but there's one big scene in Pride and Prejudice that kind of comes halfway through the book. It's kind of the watershed moment. Everything leads up to it, and then everything kind of flows out of it. And I kind of, there's this, there's this phrase that Elizabeth says about herself that I think is really, really, really interesting, and I want to hear your guys' take on it. And who's Elizabeth? So yeah, let's get into this. So... Okay, also, if, if you're uh, wary of spoilers, I'm guessing there are going to be some spoilers on this one. Yes, yeah. spoilers on this one on a, like, 200-year-old book. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, you know, we just got to have those warnings. That's true. Um, we've our, never had an a podcast. spoiler warning, but our, yeah. Don't we spoil every single we book spoil that we talk every, about? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Oh, no. Uh-uh. Let's go back and edit that in. Can we? Can you do that, AJ? Yeah. yeah, it's, it's only 160 episodes. Sure. That would be really good. Thanks. Appreciate so, you. Um, so we've now, let's see. I think we've taught Pride and Prejudice three years at the school now. And before then, I had never read it. And um, um, people usually have, like, strong feelings about Jane Austen. And the, the meme is, like, if you're a dude, you're not supposed to like them. Um, but I kind of went into re- reading it and teaching it completely, like, even keeled. I had no strong feelings about it. So some people were like, oh, it's a book about, like, marriage and stuff. It's boring. Uh, I, I, I had no idea what to expect. I love it. I think <laughs> Jane Austen, I think Pride and Prejudice probably is one of the best things written in English. Wow. Just from a pure, enjoyable quality of prose standpoint. It's a delight. It is an absolute delight. Yeah, it's great. I mean, we've, di- we've probably talked about um, uh, Port Picture of Dorian Gray at some point, or at least we've, we've made reference to the fact that we like Oscar Wilde. But there's something just about the subtlety of Jane Austen's humor and paragraphs that is just wonderful once you once you sort of click into the headspace of of people speaking in full paragraphs <laughs> <laughs> yeah jane austen has this delightful dry wit and I, I love dorian gray and i love oscar wilde but man he'll drive a nail with a bus yes you know what I mean? yes exactly mm. yeah so anyway so impression. jane austen is fantastic this book um so we'll we'll give a little bit uh, to, of onboarding you into the story just so that we can get to this 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 sort of scene that i want to talk about um but it's a story of a family called the bennett family and there are how many sisters? Five. There are five sisters. Um, yeah, five. And um, they are kind of aristocratic, but they don't have very much money. They're not like a poor family, but they don't have. They're they're not like the richy riches of their neighborhood, and they're like from kind of like small town. So they're kind of like small town upper class family, if you want to put it that way. Yeah, they're like they the, they would have a McMansion. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, and. Uh, um, dad and mom are, dad is kind of like sarcastic and withdrawn. He loves to spend time in his library and mom is. It's because of his wife. And his, and mom, the the wife is just kind of a train wreck. Um, (laughs) she was beautiful when she was young, but she's, there's not much going on upstairs and she's just constantly throughout the whole book, continuously puts her foot in her mouth and then proceeds to push it further and further in. <laughs> and has frayed nerves and, and just has, feels yes. persecuted and doesn't understand what's happening. Oh, my and word. She is a, she's just an absolute treat. Um, but she has got one ambition in life, and that is to see her daughters married because yes. there are five daughters, and the house is the house and the estate is sort of going to be given off to another cousin named uh, Mr. Collins, who is also an absolute treat of a character. 
Isn't he the super boring one? He, oh, he's not boring. Oh, I mean, he's he is uh, he's the most neck beard of neck beards. <laughs> oh, there it is. If you can imagine a milady. Yeah. He's, he tips the fedora and then oh, wanders Lord. around and oh man, it's like he just emerged from a basement and realized that he was rich and going to become a priest. Yes. There he is. is anyway, uh if we were going to do like an episode purely on Prime Prejudice, we can get further into Collins, but he's not really going to factor into this conversation. But he is <laughs> just a tree. It's just a delight to read. And, and if you decide to watch the BBC version of this, which, by the way, is actually pretty accurate to the book, and you should totally watch it. It's awesome. Whoever they got to play Mr. Collins just is pitch perfect. They got him. They got him right. Yeah. Anyway, so mom's main aspiration in life is she wants to see her daughters married well and married to somebody who can maybe, you know, like have some cash to keep the family alive, right. keep the family afloat. They don't want to give this estate or the estate's going to be given away, but they don't want to have to, like, you know, uh, move into a rental <laughs> Uh, on the wrong side of town. They want to they want to have some some money. Anyway, um, they've kind of got two eligible daughters, one just like wet sack of a person uh, <laughs> named Mary, and then Lydia, who is boy crazy, and then Kitty, who is like just a kid. So two good eligible daughters. Two good eligible daughters. And then daughters. three that are just kind of a bummer. Yeah. Um, Mary is a bummer because she just like reads books and like moralizes all day uh-huh. and Loves to sing, but is real bad at it. It's like hanging out with Focus on the Family. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh. Nothing against Focus on the Family. I mean, it's just it's, she she moralizes most of the time. That's right. Um, and then Lydia is she has sort of maybe benefited is the wrong word, but she is the result of the lack of oversight from her parents, and she is kind of boy crazy and is in love with all the boys. But anyway, but the older daughters Jane and Elizabeth are eligible young women to be married. Jane is trusting and jane is just a saint of a person and she always thinks the best of people and if ever there is a situation where you could come down and say well the reason that guy did that is because he's a jerk jane would be like no surely there's a more reasonable explanation to protect the virtue of our friend wow um jane is amazing jane is just sort of wonderful but but potentially maybe a little bit naive um and elizabeth is and, and and I think this is why Pride and Prejudice has become sort of Austin's most famous novel for in the modern for us modern people is because Elizabeth is kind of sarcastic and she's kind of sassy and she's incredibly witty and she's pretty quick to like say the perfect cutting remark um, that can still pass and people will be like you know didn't really get what she said but what she said was just absolutely cutting. And, you know, that is, the, you know, sarcasm and cutting humor is the currency of the humor today. And so, personally, that's why I think this book is so famous. I'm reading, I haven't finished it, but I'm reading Persuasion, which is um, uh, equally as good. But the main character there, Anne, is um, just as much a fascinating character to think about and to read about, but is a completely different, like, she's not sarcastic. She's... Um, 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 I'll, yeah, a little bit more nuanced. So I don't know, maybe that's why that book's not as, as, as famous or not as well-read today, because Elizabeth Bennet is just like a little razor blade of a girl. Um, she can just, uh, you know, she's very cutting in what she says, and it's great. Anyway, uh, to make a long story short, a couple of eligible bachelors roll into town, including the, the, uh, a golden retriever of a man named Bingley. What's mm-hmm. his first name? Do you remember? I can't remember Bingley's first Charles. name. Charles. Is it Charles? Yep. Oh, okay. Thanks, baby. You are most welcome. Can um, I tell you Darcy's first name? It's Fitzwilliam. Uh, that I do remember oh, okay. because that name is Fitz. dope. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Fitzy. Um, anyway, so Bingley comes in and he is affable and charming and wealthy and him and Jane immediately hit it off and to the point where almost everybody in the small town is like, oh yeah, it's happening. Jane Bennett and Charles Bingley, like, you know. Put that on the board because that's that's <laughs> happening. Like, mm-hmm. start um, start shopping for your wedding attendance. That's attire. right. And so, like, rumors are starting to go around the small town that they're going to get married. Um, and uh, anyway, and then there's another guy. He shows up. His name is Fitzwilliam Darcy, and he is m- sort of in a much higher class of aristoc- aristocrat than everybody else. Even Bingley. Like Bingley's wealthy, but Fitzwilliam Darcy is from like, you know, the the bluest of blue bloods Mm -hmm. Um, and has been bred that way Uh, has been bred to be, you know, to be uh, the sort of the upper class uh, kind of Lord of, of the realm. Um, 
Anyway, and he comes and he is seemingly a little eye rolly to be at this like hoedown barn dance <laughs> um, in the country. Mm-hmm. But Bingley's having a great time, and, and Darcy isn't. And um, but he's yeah. handsome. Bingley's dancing with all the ladies. Bingley's dancing primarily with all the ladies. Jane. Yes, and as the night goes on, Bingley's dancing more and more and more with Jane. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are more ladies at this dance than there are men. And at some point, someone's like, well, Darcy, why don't you go dancing? Um, and Elizabeth is sitting there listening. She can sort of overhear. And Darcy says something along the lines of like, I would never, ever do this. Right. Uh, I would never dance with these people. Um, and then they're like, well, what about her? What about Elizabeth Bennett? She's kind of cute. Why don't you go dance with her? And he said, she couldn't possibly tempt me to go dancing. And Elizabeth overhears this, and she's like, hot dang, what a jerk. Uh, yeah, he says something like, she's she's plain, too plain to tempt me, or yeah, something. something like that. Yeah. And Elizabeth overhears this, and she is like, well, that man's a jerk. Right. Um, and then proceeds to hold, and you know, hence the title, hold a prejudice against Darcy for the, you know, uh, a good chunk of the book. For his pride. For his pride. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And, um, and maybe we can talk about, like, the difference between pride and vanity a little bit later on. Um, but Darcy says this, and Elizabeth overhears it, and she's like, well, um, whatever, that guy that guy is a moron, uh, or that guy's a jerk, I don't like him. Um, anyway, um, and then uh, uh, the story continues, uh, it seems like Bingley's in love with Jane, and then all of a sudden, um, Bingley sort of just gets, just leaves. Mm-hmm. He's, he goes back to London, and the, the, the relationship doesn't continue, and Jane is heartbroken, Um, but Bingley hadn't proposed or anything. He's just sort of like, oh, I'm going to go back to London. And then they hear nothing, no letters, no, no anything. Um, to make a long story short, it turns out that, um, Bingley's sister, Caroline, 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 um, had been doing kind of like a subtle campaign against Jane because she doesn't like this. Caroline doesn't like this sort of poor Bennett family. And also the mom's crazy. Remember the crazy mom? And then we find out also that Darcy has weighed in and said to Bingley, like, listen, it seems like you like Jane, but Bingley, you're the kind of dude that whenever you see a pretty lady or whenever you're so, when you, you are so like in the moment that um, you're sort of all in in whatever you're doing. And then when you're not there, I know that you're going to move on to other things. So you should just move on. You don't want to marry into that family. You may like Jane, but the dad is kind of a absentee father. And the mom is, like, going to ruin every Thanksgiving for the next 30 years. So don't do it. And, uh, and Bingley's like, okay, fine, I won't. Well, that, and he thought Jane didn't really have it. Oh, that's right. And then Darcy's like, and Jane didn't really seem to like you, Bingley. Hmm. Um, uh, now, we know, as readers on the other side with Elizabeth uh, as the main character, we know that Jane is, is really in love with Bingley and is hoping that Bingley's going to ask, propose to her. But Jane is so proprietous or so that she is she doesn't wear her heart in her sleeve and she's sort of very reserved yeah, her friends even bring it up and they're like girl if you want to lock him down you got to show a little affection that's right like bat those lashes come on do something yeah but jane is so um she just thinks that that's not the way to go about things and so she kind of keeps her, all her feelings on the inside whereas when darcy looks at this he's like she's not into you dude like move on like don't don't i know you're in love with a small town girl but like she's just not feeling it yeah, and he thinks that the mom is kind of after cash, and so mm-hmm. Jane will marry you no matter what. That's right. For your money, even yeah. though she doesn't like yeah. you very much. So it just seems like a bad idea. And so Darcy's thinking, like, you know, in 15 years, you're going to realize, oh, I married a woman who doesn't love me, and it's just for my money. I'm trying to save you now. Anyway. Um, now, meanwhile, Elizabeth, um, as the sort of the story goes on, um, she eventually finds out about that, and that does not ingratiate her any further into Darcy. Right. And then she also meets this young, handsome soldier named Wickham. And Wickham is eligible, and he is charming, and he is handsome, and he comes with this terribly sad sob story that Darcy screwed him out of his fortune as a young man. Wickham tells Elizabeth this story, and of course... Um, uh, when Elizabeth hears it, she's like, obviously, obviously, Darcy is just the worst. Look at this. He's even ruined this young man's life. And Jane has a very good point to Elizabeth. And she's like, but how can that be? Bingley is a nice guy. Oh. Bingley is best friends with Darcy. And does Bingley seem like a bad judge of character? And Elizabeth's like, no. <laughs> then why would Bingley be friends with Darcy 
if Darcy was such a cad, if Darcy was such a like jerk that he screwed Wickham out of money, Jane says, there's probably more to the story we don't understand. Elizabeth says, no, Jane, I pretty much <laughs> I understand this. what's going on here. Right. And it's that like uh, Bingley's kind of a fool and Darcy's a jerk and Wickham's, you know, been wronged. And Jane's like, ah, I just don't know. That just doesn't, that just doesn't fit. All, all the pieces don't fit into place. And Elizabeth's like, what more evidence do you need? Uh, um, um, obviously, you know, sort of giving in to her predisposed prejudice against Darcy. Right. When, when this new story comes up, in her mind, it completely fits into place that Darcy's a jerk. She had fallen into one of the three classic blunders. Mm. Number one, never get involved in a land war in Asia. Mm. Did she number do this? Two, oh, no, that was in the blunder she didn't get involved in. Yeah, number two, don't go up against a Sicilian with de- when death is on the line. Mm-hmm. And number three, how could someone so hot be a liar? Exactly. Right, she wow. fell into the third For one. sure. Mm. How can Wiccan be a liar? The dude is fine. Yeah. Yeah. Like, he, he looks good. He talks good. He, he must has be good. to yeah. be good. He must be a good person. Yeah. Um, and then, so... Um, Just reading through the book at this point, are you supposed to be taking Elizabeth's side? Like, yes. Is it presented as if Darcy is actually a horrible person? Like, Wickham is sympathetic. She's a little hard on him. She is hard on Darcy. But it does seem you, like a toot. But he does seem... He is, you know... Yeah, um, he he makes these claims, you know, there are scenes where she's staying at their house and Darcy's mm-hmm. there and Darcy is talking about like the kind of woman that he wants. Um, and mainly Darcy's saying this because he's trying to blow off Caroline yep. Bingley, yes. who's like throwing herself yes. at him. Well, and like trying to actively flirt with Elizabeth when he's talking about That's it. Right. He outlines these things. He's like, this is what I want in a girl and someone who improves their mind with reading. And it just so happens that at that moment, Elizabeth is reading library, a book right? and Caroline is wandering around because she can't sit down for two minutes to read a book. That's right. And he's I think he is actively trying to flirt with her. And she thinks he's oh, I've never met a woman like this. He's um, so prideful. No women fit this description. And that's she right. is Dar- like yeah, Darcy's totally ba- misunderstanding yeah. it. Darcy's describing her as the kind of person that he wants. And Elizabeth's like, there's no perfect person like that, Darcy. Uh, you're never going to find anybody. And it's just like, gosh darn it, Elizabeth. <laughs> like, just huge miscommunications yes. happening. So that's, you know, so huge miscommunications. So Darcy's flirting with Elizabeth. Elizabeth's like, oh, what a arrogant jerk. Um, and Caroline... Caroline is like... As he tries to compliment yeah, her. Yeah. Every time Darcy says something, Darcy's like, I want a woman who improves her mind with reading. So Caroline, like the next scene, is like sitting with a book. Yeah. And <laughs> anyway, but she's a terrible person. Um, and, uh, well, she is. Um, and um, uh, anyway, so as... yeah, So yes, it's presented that uh, like Darcy is proud. Mm-hmm. but which he, which he is, right? Which he is. Yeah. And then he is prou- proud even when the whole story comes out. Right. And Elizabeth, but Elizabeth is quite hard on him. Yes. And Jane is kind of pointing this out like, hey, listen, Elizabeth, you shouldn't, you shouldn't close your mind or you shouldn't sort of make conclusions about people so quickly without all the facts. Mm. Jane doesn't come out and like say it explicitly like that, but she sort of implies that. And Elizabeth's like, no, you should totally make up your mind when you have enough facts. Mm. Um, Wickham good, Darcy bad, right? This <laughs> obviously. Sure. Um, but then. But then. Uh, uh, does Darcy come back? Is that so? Uh, um, I'm trying to. I, I'm. I know I'm going to get the order of this wrong, and because I'm going to get the order of this wrong, we're going to get like hashtag read the book uh, uh, responses to this. So, so we'll so, be trending on Twitter. That'd be yeah. great. Okay, good. <laughs> so I, I'm sure I'm going to get the order. All press is good press. Yeah, right? I'm sure I'm going to get the order of this wrong. But so the aliens come first. But at some point, yeah, there's zombies. Yeah. Right? Oh, I'm, there's so zombies. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, at one point. Um, Darcy proposes to Elizabeth. He like comes in and in one a movie adaptation, it's like pouring rain, which is real lame. Uh, it's, it's not awesome. pouring rain in the book. No, it's like great. a beautiful sunny day. Oh, come, oh, come on. Um, and this is the second time she's been proposed to in the book. Oh, the yeah. First... We're not even talking about Mr. Collins because that's not... That's not <laughs> the first uh, was Mr. Collins and oh, the most awkward proposal ever. Her <laughs> out dismissal of, nowhere. of Mr. Collins' oh. proposal is an absolute treat. It but is a joy of literature. Who does Collins end up with, though? He ends up with Charlotte, like and, this like other... Cu- this oh, this oh. like 30-year-old woman who's like, I'm never going to marry anybody. The first person that... Resp- she has this theory that like happiness in marriage is basically a crapshoot. Mm. So if the person kind of ticks a couple of the boxes, a couple of the boxes, like go for it and roll those dice, baby. Oh my gosh. Um, and so that's, and you know what? No, she stop, no, like, stop. She does okay. She's kind of right. <laughs> yeah. Oh She's kind of okay. Anyway. And um, it's, it's really funny. Liz turns down Mr. Collins. She's like, I will not marry you. And he's like, I know it's tradition among females to oh, say yes. no the first time and thereby try to like yes. enhance our ardor for the marriage. And she's like, I will not marry you. He's like, <laughs> I hear what you're saying, and I'll come back in two I'll ch- days. I'll and check ask in tomorrow. You. Like, see how it's, it's going. So insufferable. 
He's like, I read it once on Reddit. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, oh, so, so yeah, so this, but anyway, Darcy comes and uh, the scene is so overwrought with tension because um, we have been insinuated. Well, Elizabeth, yeah. So at this point, Elizabeth has found out that Darcy basically put the kibosh on the marriage between Jane and Bingley. And the reasons being that um, Darcy disapproved of the family. And Elizabeth is like, what the junk? Like, you don't like my family. Right. Um, and that, now Darcy is coming, and he comes to the house all by himself. Elizabeth's uh, visiting her cousin. Actually, she's vis- visiting Charlotte, who married uh, Bingley. Sorry, who married uh, Collins. And she's sitting there, and Darcy shows up, and he's, like, all visibly distraught. And he sits on the couch. And I think it says that he sat there for, like, a good, like, six or seven minutes <laughs> in silence, like, wrestling with something in her mind. And Elizabeth sitting here being like, what is happening? Mm-hmm. And well, she then, still hates him at She point. still hates so him. She has like, no why idea you why here? he's there. Like, if I could burst you into flames with my eyes. <laughs> she thought, didn't she think he, he came to sort of make fun of her or something? Yeah, she yeah. has no idea. Anyway, he's right. sitting here and then he basically goes into this whole speech about despite his better judgment and reason, <laughs> he loves her and wants to marry her. Perfect. Yeah. And she's through like, all his efforts wow. to the contrary. Through all his efforts, he's like, even though there's no reason why I would want to be joined to your family. <laughs> no, he doesn't go in that strong, but he basically insinuates it. He's like, despite all of these things, I love you and I want to marry you. And she's like, no, cool. yeah. of course not. And then um, he says, well, well Why? Um, and she responds that he has not been a gentleman, which really stings Darcy's pride. And then she lays out these two charges. One, you have been really mean to poor, handsome, sexy Mr. Wickham. And, <laughs> oh, my, oh, my gosh. And, um, He's so sexy yes, and you did him wrong. <laughs> you did him wrong, and he deserved better. Right. All he wanted to do was be a small-town country priest, and now— uh, uh, because his his father served your father for all these many years, and you had to screw over his life, and now he's like like slogging away in the military. And you think suck, Darcy. Of the sexiness you have denied the church. That's right. You oh <laughs> exactly. Oh um, and then the second one, Darcy's like, yeah, I don't deny that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then the second one is you messed up the marriage, and Darcy's like, yeah. Your mom's crazy, and Jane <laughs> doesn't like Bingley, and my he's my best friend, and mm. Bingley is so how do you describe it he's not headstrong he's so like he's impulsive he's, he's impulsive sliding. that's it yeah he he's he'll like, just he just does stuff on a whim because he has money and he can he's like so the way i imagine him is he's sort of the the guy that joins the frat and is ultra wealthy and everybody loves him but doesn't drink with everybody else because he doesn't want to so yeah. all the girls are totally head over heels for him and he's just having a great time all the time. And yes, and whatever's kind of in front of him, he's all about. And then when it's not in front of him, he kind of forgets about it. Yeah. And Darcy knows this. Mm-hmm. And he's like, okay, here's this girl from a family that needs money. She doesn't seem that into you. Mom is like cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. And um, dad is not a very good dad. Dad right. is kind of, dad is funny. Dad is witty. But dad is like withdrawn and in the library all day. And um, uh, which is going to have problems later on in the book. Um, and Darcy's so Darcy kind of sits Bingley down. And he's like, "Listen, don't just no, just forget about Jane. Find somebody else." And Bingley's like, "Okay." <laughs> um, and but we know, yes, obviously Jane's in love with Bingley. And so Elizabeth brings this up, and she's like, "You have come between the happiness of my sister and right. a man that she loves." And Darcy's like, "Jane loves Bingley. What are you mm. talking about?" Well, he didn't really say that stuff he, then. That's right. He just sort of got angry and quiet mm-hmm. that she yes. had brought up these things. Yes. And so he doesn't, and so she's like, you got in between, uh, 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 my sister and Bingley and you ruined his happy, her happiness. And Darcy's kind of flustered. And he doesn't really know what to say. Um, and then she brings up the whole Wickham thing. And at that point, Darcy's like, yeah, I totally nuked Wickham. Like, you don't even know what you're talking about. Is, yeah, is this when he tells her the truth? No, okay. not yet. And Elizabeth's like, I don't need to know anything else. I know all okay. I need to know about you. You have acted ungentlemanly. And Darcy's like, well, I would appreciate it if we never talk about today again and me proposing to you because <laughs> right. this is super embarrassing. Yep. And Jane's like, oh, sorry, Elizabeth's like, totally agreed. Um, and then Darcy runs off and Jane is, ah, sorry, Elizabeth is just an emotional wreck. And she's just, by herself, her sister is back at home, and she's, like, on vacation, and she just cries for, like, half an hour. She's just so emotionally frazzled. And poor Bingley. I mean, she. I think she said something to the effect of, there is no inducement that could could get me to the place where I would marry you. Oh, like, to nothing Darcy. Nothing you could yeah, do yeah. to Darcy. Yeah, mm-hmm. so, to Darcy. And 
basically says, you are the last man in the county I could be yeah. like Im- made to marry. And we have to remember that Darcy is from the upper echelons of the arist- aristocracy. He's a Kennedy. Or, he's yes, he's <laughs> exactly. He's a Kennedy, you know. He and and um uh, uh you know, Elizabeth like lives in Circle C. That's right. That's a, that's a little <laughs> suburban neighborhood here where the school is in. He's being in Austin, rejected Texas. by someone who he thinks is far beneath him. Yes. Like yes. the the idea that she could even say no to his proposal is yeah. probably shocking in because the first place. Because he's right. he's the, the whole reason he's agitated is like despite the fact that everyone thinks I shouldn't marry you and your mom's nuts I'm still going to propose. Right. And he's assuming she's going to say yes. I will yes. bestow upon you the gift of my <laughs> attention. Right. Exactly. And she's like, no, scram. Um, anyway, next day, um, Darcy uh, like finds her in the park mm-hmm. and he does the, you know, the teenage boy thing where he's like, I wrote you this letter. And he gives it to her and like scuttles oh. off. He like sort of like swooshes away. Uh-huh. Whoosh. And he's gone. And Dar- Elizabeth's like, what? <laughs> what is read this, this thing? Yeah. <laughs> And it's true. <laughs> I'm just imagining him doing the vampire thing with the cloak where yeah. he sort of pulls it around and <laughs> he's gone. Off. And then I know this is a huge lead up into this, this scene that I want to talk about. So Elizabeth reads the letter and wherein she finds um, Darcy's side mm-hmm. of the story. About, and, Wick, about Wickham. Uh, well, right. Wickham and about Bingley. Okay. And so about Wickham, turns out that Wickham is, albeit sexy, not a good person. Mm-hmm. Who'd have thought? <laughs> um, and uh, he... Um, uh, wasn't in, in fact owed an inheritance and was supposed to go be a clergyman at the church and he goes to Darcy and he's like I don't want to do that that sounds super lame I want to go into law instead of um, instead of like paying for my um, installation which is I guess how it worked back then just give me the lump sum and I'm going to go to law school and Darcy says okay I will do this and that is going to withdraw my debt my father's debt to your father and you get this huge lump sum of money you go to law school becomes like rock and roll Darcy gives him the money. Wickham goes to law school, does not go to law school. Or he right. goes to law school, but he blows all the money on, like, parties and betting and and uh, general... Um, Dissolution? Yes. Uh, debauchery yeah. in the 19th century style, like tennis and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, Played back end yes. for money. Um, anyway, so, and then Wickham blows all his money and is in super debt. And then he's like, and he sucks at law, like just as uh, a terrible lawyer, or he can't even pass the, the classes. Uh-huh. And he goes back. He's like, you know what, Darcy? I think I'm going to be a country <laughs> priest after all. Darcy's like, no, you're not. Yeah. Um, I gave you all the money. You, I gave. I'm not like you've gotten everything that was owed to you. That's not happening. That and why in the world would I install you as a priest after yes, the way you've acted? Exactly. Right? And yeah. you are not a great priest. You are, you know, kind of a mess. Yeah. Um. And so Wickham's like, fine. Meanwhile, Darcy's little kid sister. Georgiana, <laughs> I can't remember, Georgiana, Georgiana Darcy um, is going to like, not boarding school, she's going to live with this tutor and, and you know, do her lady, lady learnings. Um, and the tutor turns out to be real good friends with Mr. Wickham and the tutor uh, kind of like forged her papers of like letters of recommendation and the tutor is not a great person. Um, Georgiana is there, Wickham shows up basically like woos Georgiana and Georgiana's like 15 and Wickham is handsome and Georgiana thinks she's in love with Wickham and Wickham's like girl it's always been you um and uh I love you and we got to run away and get married and Georgiana's like yes away from your brother away from your brother (laughs) ideally (laughs) and get all of your money while it's for us to do this right and Georgiana's like yes this is what romance is um Darcy finds out about this uh, uh, throw, sort of throws a kibosh on this thing. Georgiana realizes that she has been duped uh, and that Wickham doesn't love her and she's mortified, almost like for the rest of the book she's embarrassed. Right. Um, and Darcy's like, don't worry, nobody knows about it. Wickham is trash, he's out of our life uh, and I'm going to protect you, little sister. Graham, AJ, before we go any further, I want to thank our Patreon sponsors for making this episode possible. Uh, Our Patreon sponsors support us at one of four levels. I'm going to go through them right now because I think many people listening, they want to be a part of this as well. They want to become patrons as well. Uh, We have a $2 a month tier. Those are Ghibellines. At $2 a month, you get access to all of our episodes ad-free. You also get access to previous uh, uh, content that we've done, mostly at uh, conferences. Um, So you get uh, access to many other uh, bonus episodes as well. At $10 a month, you get access to our our, uh, in-between episodes, which we record after every single episode that we record. 
you also get access to our monthly AMAs, which I think are really funny, some of our best content. In addition to all the same benefits at the $2 a month tier, you get access to ad-free episodes. Above that, at the $20 a month tier, you uh, at that point are giving input into the podcast. You are helping us come up with future topics to come up with future merchandise in addition to all benefits from the tiers below that. And finally, and you heard about this uh, in recent episodes, we have added a Helios' Acolytes of Love tier at $100 a month. At this level, you are a true believer and you are the most faithful of our listeners. At this tier, you get all the benefits from lower tiers. You also get, I can't believe I'm saying these words, that you get a Helios' Acolytes of Love crew neck sweatshirt. You get Helios' Acolytes of Love Crocs and you get all uh, a free uh, copy of all future merchandise as we create it. So incredible, incredible benefits at this, at this level that is only for $100 a month. You can find all of this at patreoncom slash classical stuff. Thanks again to our patrons and um, thank you all for listening. Okay. He tells Elizabeth Bennett this in the letter. Right. So he c- brings her into the confidence of like the Darcy family secret of Georgiana and what Wickham did. And he also gives his side of the story, which is, Jane doesn't seem all that interested in Bingley. Your mom is nuts. Um, Your younger sisters are either boy crazy or weirdly show them. Like Mary is really bad at singing, but insists on playing the piano at every party for as long as she possibly can. (laughs) And then moralizing to everyone at the table. The mom wants them to marry rich people and talks about it loudly. It's And mom also talks about sort of unsubtly how much she hates Darcy. Mm. Um, And Lydia is boy crazy. Like, Um, And then Kitty just follows Lydia around and does the same thing. That's right. And Kitty is turning into Lydia. And, like, if Lydia had a cell phone, it would be all over. Like, it would be bad. (laughs) Sure. Um, She'd be the kind of girl who's trying to be an influencer, but... Is not a very, yeah. Only failing. moderately succeeding. That's right. She and has, just, like... just giving it every effort. Like a 200-viewer, like, makeup tutorial. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Lydia's not great, um, and she is quite improprietous and um, uh, is sort of throwing herself at the boys, and Darcy looks at this whole kind of family that's, you know, kind of a mess with two little jewels of girls, uh, Jane and Elizabeth, and um, so he says, that's why I told Bingley not to marry Jane. I didn't even think Jane was into him. Elizabeth gets this whole side of the story and realizes that she has been completely wrong. And this is the scene that I want to look at because this letter roughly comes halfway through the book and Elizabeth, well, let me read the section right when Elizabeth sort of gets this. Um, um, so here's, here's where it says, she, Elizabeth, grew absolutely ashamed of herself. Of neither Darcy nor Wickham could she think without feeling that she had been blind, partial, prejudiced, absurd. How despicably have I acted, she cried. I, who have prided myself on my discernment. I, who have valued myself on my abilities. Who have often disdained the generous candor of my sister and gratified my vanity in useless or blamable distrust. How humiliating is this discovery, yet how just a humiliation. Had I been in love, I could not have been more wretchedly blind. But vanity, not love, has been my folly. Pleased with the preference of one, and offending by the neglect of the other, on the very beginning of our acquaintance, I have courted prepossession, or prejudice, and ignorance, and driven reason away where either was were concerned. Till this moment, I never knew myself. And this is the, the this is the section that I find to be really interesting. I, I think it's kind of the key to the book, and it's that the re, uh, now spoilers. The, the book continues on. Elizabeth, with new eyes, observes Darcy. There's she uh, ends up going to his house for some reason, um, and she spends time with Darcy. And Darcy's like, oh. I proposed to you and now you're in my house. This Mm. sucks. And he's like super embarrassed about it. Well, he switches around too because he realizes his own pride. Yeah, then this is the point. So because Elizabeth has confronted Darcy and basically stung him with a misunderstanding of Darcy, but also a truth that Darcy has been proud. And and so that begins sort of the wheels of change in Darcy. But also Elizabeth has been stung by this misunderstanding and it has revealed as she says herself to herself and she realizes that she pretty much 
jumps to conclusions about people. She can be quite prejudiced about how people act, either in favor or against. And eventually Elizabeth and Darcy improve as characters and they end up um, sort of patching things up and falling in love. And Darcy does a tremendous act of charity to the Bennett family to save them from an embarrassing situation involved li- involving Lydia and Spring Break. And um, uh, essentially. Um, right. And um, that, and then eventually Darcy and Elizabeth do get married. But their relationship, their happy ending, their sort of the, uh, the elevation of both of them into, into the, the, this covenant of marriage where they are, you know, everyone's blown away that they get married. But they are so well suited is because that they are both humble or willing enough to analyze their own faults of character. And it, but what I find really interesting is the only way that they could have themselves revealed to themselves was to be in an incredibly, like, personally painful situation. So Darcy gets called out for being arrogant and there's a grain of truth to it. And Darcy has always viewed... Let me read another section that, about what Darcy says about his own arrogance. So, yeah, Elizabeth has always viewed her... What she now realizes is a prejudice. She's always viewed it as her strength. Oh, I can just read people. Mm-hmm. You know what? I'm just really good at, like, reading the room. And when somebody says something, I know the kind of person that they are. And Jane earlier in the book calls her out and she's like, maybe there's more to the story. And Elizabeth's like, maybe you're naive, Jane. <laughs> um, and uh, so Elizabeth has always prided herself on this character mm-hmm. um, trait of what, what, what would be the opposite of prejudice, of discernment, mm-hmm. I think is what she calls it. And then it turns out that that is a blind spot in her character um, and she's mortified. Darcy has always prided himself on his f- how would you what would, how would you describe it, Hannenberg? Weirdly enough, I think humility. He didn't. I don't think he really had the opportunity to be humble, but he had always been taught in virtue. So in principle, yeah. he was humble, but in practice, he was pride, proud. Yeah, proud. He he's always been. He's not vain. So there's a good distinction between vanity and pride. Vanity is like you care what people think about you. Pride is that you value the good things that you have as good things and you don't besmirch them or belittle them, even when people, even when it's like maybe kind of socially awkward too. So, well, pride is when you think so much of yourself that you don't give two rips what other people think. Well, that's maybe the negative, the, the, the like the pride that's gone sour or that's gone bad. Isn't there like a good, wouldn't you call no. this the sort of good form of pride? Agent meant that as a positive thing. Graham, you're saying it's a bad thing. Mm. Because oh, no, I, I meant it as a negative. Oh, I thought, are you responding to the, you should care what other people think? Well, um, this is where you get into trouble with pride is because it has like 12 different definitions. Yeah. I'm talking about the definition of pride as a vice where yeah. you think incredibly high, highly of yourself. Right. A good pride, it would be... Should have a different word. Yeah. You, yeah. We, so know. it's either taking warm pleasure in the things that you enjoy forget and forgetting yourself or being pleased that someone else that you want to please has praised you. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Or like a warm affection for, like if I'm proud of my kid, that's a warm affection. It's different than thinking incredibly highly of myself to the detriment of all others. If we are proud of 163 episodes of Classical Stuff podcast, we're not being arrogant about that. You know, we we are pleased. You know, it, 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 we're happy about it. We're pleased about it. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Just as an example. If that's an accurate, yeah. But what, we would be proud of the work that we put into it. Yeah. And then we think that we've done something good. Yes, that's what I mean. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So Darcy, uh, so anyway, so for Darcy, this has been the thing that he thought was a character, uh, a, a positive character trait. And then he realizes, oh, crap, I'm coming off as as arrogant. Right. And he's gone gone through this personal crisis. So he says this about himself. Um, uh, I have been uh, a selfish being. He says this towards the end of the book. I have been a selfish being all my life in practice. In practice, though not in principle. As a child, I was taught what was right, but I was not taught to correct my temper. I was given good principles, but left to follow them in pride and conceit. Unfortunately, an only son, I was spoiled by my parents. An only child. Uh, only son, sorry. I was spoiled by my parents, who, though good themselves, allowed, encouraged, almost taught me to be selfish and overbearing, to care for none beyond my own family circle, to think merely of all the rest of the world, to wish at least to think meanly on their sense and worth compared with my own. So he was basically, his parents were well-intentioned, and they were saying things like, listen, Darcy, 
you've had the best teachers, you come from a great family, you have all of the advantages of life. Um, don't waste that by trying to fit in with the world, I guess is kind of what they've sort of taught him, which is, you know, advice that can very easily go wrong in the heart of a child to have him be a little arrogant, or at least come across as arrogant. So yes, Darcy was proud and arrogant, and Elizabeth was sort of uh, sarcastically dismissive, but it took a crisis and an embarrassment for, their, for themselves to be revealed to themselves. And because they were willing to face that mm -hmm. in their own character and work at changing it, then they get the happy ending. Then, then they be, are able to sort of um, um, both be elevated as people and right. then join together. But that's what's surprising about Elizabeth's response, because she could have just as easily said... Darcy's just making all this up. This is all a lie. She could have doubled down. Yes, and then would have missed out on the change and would have missed out on Darcy ultimately. Yeah, and there are corroborations to Darcy's story. Like, so there's this other character who right. can corroborate, and Darcy's like, if you don't believe me, ask that guy. Sure, but I guess that's the... I think this is what you're saying, is that she chooses to uh, take it as true, and then it causes her to question a lot of other things in her life that, well, if I'm wrong about this, could I have been wrong about being yes. uh, um, snarky in all of my situations? And when she does this, she begins to sort of relook at everything, that she, all the conclusions that she has, most fascinating, including the conclusions that she has about her own family. And so when she realizes that her, um, her discernment maybe isn't infallible, she now looks at her mom with new eyes right. and realizes mom's kind of embarrassing. She looks at her, most interesting, looks, looks at her father with new eyes and realizes that when she was young, she thought dad was kind of sarcastic and funny, like sniping people with his, with his witty comments from the office. Now she realizes like, that's actually not the best way to be a dad. Well, he really should have reined in the two youngest daughters. That's and he right. Hasn't, he has given them pretty much free reign to stay out of the way of his, his wife. And those daughters have turned out not great because he has given That's them right. no direction. And they're like boy crazy on Snapchat. And, yeah. you know, and, and she can see this now. Mm -hmm. um, and we are, it's insinuated that Darcy has gone through sim a similar mm -hmm. kind of like crisis of character. Um, and so what I find really fascinating about this is the thing that these characters thought were their strengths or they thought were like character... Um, yeah, the character strengths end up actually being their weak spots and the things that they that could have brought down their downfall, mm -hmm. right? So the definition of like the sort of tra of a tragedy like is when the character at the end of the story realizes who they are and what they did brought them down to ruin, but it's too late. Right. Whereas with Pride and Prejudice, it's not too late. Elizabeth um, has time to make it well to make it right, and she makes it right, and so does Darcy in the end. Um, when they do that, uh, they can love each other and be married, and um, and it's it's you know so satisfying. Um, and so uh, I'm just so my question is: Do you think that that is true? Do you think that it takes personal crisis or maybe even like embarrassment for you know the person quote to for till this moment I never knew myself? Like if we want to, if Socrates. If his advice is know thyself, is the only way to, for us to know ourselves to submit ourselves to that kind of embarrassment or, or seek out those kinds of moments where we can kind of see what we're made of. I don't know. This is um, maybe we don't want to seek out embarrassment, but maybe we shouldn't try so hard to what not put ourselves out there or not try so hard to limit the psychic pain of life that can happen in, in relationships. But even in this example, Elizabeth didn't seek out embarrassment. No, she was, she had a way of interacting in the world and it conflicted with reality ultimately. Mm -hmm. And she found out about that conflict. And then it was incumbent on her to figure out whether she needed to change something or whether she was right in the first place. So I'm, I, I don't, I, I almost think you don't need to seek it out because at some point, reality will be in conflict with some way that you exist in the world unless you're good pious and yeah and, and so maybe perfect. don't don't seek it out but when it comes you need to recognize 
that this is a this is an inflection point for your life, right? Like, so there are other characters who their embarrassments are revealed to themselves, and they're either too naive, too ignorant, or too proud to change. Lydia is a great example. So maybe for your listeners, so what happens with the younger character of Lydia is she's boy crazy. She goes off to like Cabo. It's not Cabo. Where does she go? Brighton. She goes off to like a beach town, a party town, and um, uh, flirts with all the boys. And lo and behold, she ends up with sexy Wickham and they run off together and they get, they're going to get married and the whole family is mortified because they think that Wickham just wants. Well, they were supposed to get married. Yes. That's what Lydia thought they were doing. Oh yes. It seemed like Wickham had other designs, other designs and his design because she was not wealthy was just to hang out with her in London for a while to her public destruction. That's right. Be like, you know what girl? Like I love you and we're, we'll get married eventually. We're essentially married already in our hearts. Yeah. <laughs> oh gosh. Um, and everyone can see this, and Lydia right, doesn't right. now. And then the great charity that Darcy does is he swoops in and pays all, and basically like strong arms Wickham to marry Lydia and do the right thing. Yep. And so now Wickham is married to Lydia, which is just perfect revenge. Well, um, and they they only stay happy for what is it like a year, and then they run out of money, and they keep on asking all their relatives for money. Yep. and Don't love each other anymore, and oh, it's rough. But the point being hmm. that like. Lydia gets into this crisis of life and can't see it. She it, can't see her character. Yes, exactly. That, that's what I'm saying. Of So she has a conflict with reality. If she thinks life mm-hmm. will be easy and happy, and then ultimately it's not. Well, then what does she do with it? She keeps trying to ask for money instead of trying to turn things around. I guess, and she sort of externalizes the problems. Yes. Like, all the problems of life are these unfair things like, you know... Um, Wickham can't get a job or blah, 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 blah. And and there's always a problem outside of herself. The other thing is that um, the father is confronted with his problem, which is that he should have been a better dad to the the kids. And he doesn't really have a change. He sort of jokes that Kitty's never going to leave the house until Mm -hmm. she's 40 or something like that. But he doesn't like – do anything take her out for like daddy daughter dates to like you know talk to her about life you know he's still um uh locked into the library so he maybe and maybe it's because he's too old maybe there's this point where um you are so set in your ways that a crisis of life cannot reveal yourself to yourself lydia is not too old and she has that same fair point so i this is my question is like if if the happiness of darcy and elizabeth depended on some kind of quality that they had to be not so arrogant or not so proud or not so blind. Like, what is that quality? And how do we get it? <laughs> so that we can be happy. Is it just humility or is it... Mm, I think it's more than that. I, I, but I think one of the main questions is, do you have to wait for a crisis for the for self-improvement to happen? Is that something we should seek? Like, everyone has these blind spots, right? Yeah. And so do I have to wait until reality comes and punches me in the mouth? to find those blind spots or can I seek them out earlier? Well, I don't think seeking them out is, I think yeah. ideally you have some sort of self introspection where you can kind of ferret these things out early, but then you get, there's always the danger of too much introspection where you become self-focused and proud. Yeah, I mean, let's qualify like the crisis, quote unquote crisis that Elizabeth is going through. is not life or death. Like a guy that she thought was a yep. jerk proposes to her and she's like embarrassed about it. But she almost missed out on Felicity, like marital True. Felicity. There, yeah. There's danger there. I guess my point being that like, um, she doesn't realize how, I don't know. You never really know how big the crisis is when you're in the middle of it. Mm-hmm. Or, uh, and the other thing I was thinking of coming into this podcast is like the quote unquote, uh, uh, like character flaw of Elizabeth is not huge. This hmm. isn't like a, like, this isn't a, uh, a a damning thing. Maybe it is. She's just kind of a toot sometimes. She's just kind of a toot sometimes. And Darcy is kind of, like, wrapped up in his status sometimes. Maybe Darcy's a little bit more unpalatable to us as... as modern. Modern people who don't have an aristocracy. But, I mean, uh, my students this year were like, what's so wrong with Elizabeth? She's mm-hmm. hilarious, right? And she's she can, like, you know put people in her place. Why is she so mortified when she realizes this about herself? Well, it's partially because it's motivated from her injured pride. Yeah. Right. She's so angry with him because he called her plain. 
Yeah. And that's that's the source of it. And then she just doesn't like that he won't dance with anyone and that he won't dance with her. And Well, she's all, but she's really upset about the Jane thing. The, the, the he that's called true. me plain doesn't come up too much in, after that fact. But the fact yeah, that he true. came in between Jane is the one that really bugs her. Um, but anyway, I guess that question is still like, what is it about? Do they just, so do these characters just have a a willingness to change or or um I, I think it's the problem is that a process such as the one that both of those characters went through requires several several virtues the first is humility right mm-hmm. a willingness to see your own faults and then you need fortitude or diligence to push your way into changing mm-hmm. right you need some self-awareness. You need kind of like there, there is sort of an interchange between all of the virtues that are necessary. And justice. Here. Like Elizabeth says, I have done Darcy wrong in the way that I've thought about him. Yeah. And justice. And then a little bit of prudence and wisdom. And that this is why Aristotle and a few other philosophers said, once you are corrupt, once you have lost out on the virtues, it is almost an impossible road back and maybe even actually impossible because if you are if you are missing one of those, say mm-hmm. you have the humility and you've got a little bit of wisdom, but you've got no fortitude, you're just going to stay in your little pool and sure. hate yourself. Mm-hmm. Or if you've got no humility, you're going to refuse the lesson. Mm-hmm. And if you've got no sense of justice, you'll be like, ah, well, screw it, Darcy, whatever. I mean, screw that guy. He didn't, he'll never know. Yeah, he earned it. Right. And then we see. So an example of this is Lydia. Right. She mm-hmm. she went through the crisis. She but she is not she has no wisdom. Right. Mm-hmm. She doesn't know what's happening around her. She doesn't know the danger she was in. She can't see that her husband doesn't love her. She doesn't know the social dangers. Like she just doesn't understand society at all. Mm-hmm. And this is what prevents her from a few fut- from in the future learning from her mistake. Yeah. And then you have Mary, who is lacking humility. Yeah. Right? And, and also sort of social social graces as well. Like stop singing, Mary. Yeah. <laughs> she's lacking a few social graces, but I, I'd say the big hit on her is the lack of humility. She's, she's proud. She moralizes mm-hmm. all the time. And then you've got Kitty, who's, I don't know, maybe got no fortitude. Like she just, she's pliable. Uh, but the, but the, the, the redeeming quality of Kitty is that at the end of the story, Kitty spends more time with Jane and Elizabeth and mm. to her better, to her, yeah. to her uh, yeah, improvement. But the, that's what I mean. She's pliable. She's sure. got no yeah. self fortitude. Yeah. So I think a sort of change on this magnitude takes several virtues to affect and a a big problem in any one of them is going to kind of put the lockdown on it mm-hmm. and so the more virtues you're missing the harder this process becomes mm-hmm. does elizabeth realize that she loves darcy in that moment with the letter no later it's a slow growing once she first she's embarrassed and if she never saw darcy again she probably would just chalked it up to embarrassment and would try not to think about it but the fact that she sort of continuously her path keeps crossing with darcy Then she begins to see him in his home, in his sphere, and she sees him with new eyes. As he deals with Wickham and Lydia. As he deals with Wickham and Lydia, as he sort of comes alongside his younger sister as she's growing up and trying to introduce... Because his younger sister is like so mortified from her past that she almost can't look another human being in the eye, even if they don't know about it. And so Darcy's quite patient and trying to like improve his younger sister's life. And so Elizabeth begins to see his finer qualities... And it's like a slow kind of growing love that happens. And Darcy just keeps on loving her. And at one point, they're walking together and he's like, if you still don't like me, tell me now because I can't handle it anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Um, So Darcy is still interested in her even after Elizabeth's rejection. Yes. And, Mm -hmm. okay, in in response to your question of what is necessary to this, I was trying to formulate love as the answer to that. Aquinas talks about love as the thing that pulls you toward another object. Mm-hmm. And for Darcy, that could make sense that for him to draw close to the object of his affection, Elizabeth, he has to change mm-hmm. and he, he can't approach her as he is now. Mm-hmm. So there's some, there's something to be said on that side. It sounds like Elizabeth's change happens before that attraction though, if I'm hearing that correctly, hmm. or does it happen yeah, that's over a good, time? No, that's as, a good question. Do they refine each other as they draw closer to each other? Anyway, I'm trying to, uh, yeah, that's the, the thought. The, the difficulty is we don't really, Darcy just alludes to the fact that he was so troubled by what Elizabeth says that he w- does the work of improving himself. Yep. Whereas with Elizabeth, it's basically her embarrassment of the situation, but then her determination that the next time she's in a situation, she is going to be charitable right. to Darcy that and and when she does that so at the, when she receives this letter when she realizes that she has done him wrong she doesn't like say i can't believe i rejected him for marriage right. i got to make this right, right. um uh she feels like that ship has sailed mm-hmm. 
um, until the end when he proposes again. Right. Um, and so uh, it's almost like she wants to make amends for her, the wrong that she's done him in her own heart. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, uh, And by doing that, I guess by like basically seeking Darcy's forgiveness by her acts right. of treating him as he should have been treated by being not as bad as she thought by seeking forgiveness and him essentially doing that right. well continuing to well like welcome her and he still loves her right. then from that her she her heart grows into love that's what again i haven't read pride and prejudice in a while sorry that um two out of three ain't bad Tom. <laughs> two out of three ain't bad that it, <laughs> like you just can't ignore that the point at the end of the book is a marriage yes so exactly from halfway Mm -hmm. point till end of the book has to get us to marriage so the point of their improvement isn't just a stoic knuckle down do what you have to it's preparing them for union Mm -hmm. that's why i'm just trying to but i don't again i don't know if i'm overstating is the marriage kind of a byproduct of their improvement i think so and also just darcy's fidelity right like darcy will is remaining darcy's not like well Move on, old boy. Like, go find someone else to marry. He's, like, still in love with her, and he doesn't know what to do about it. Right. I think um, it probably even got him going more. To have someone reject him, yeah. yes, it sets her even higher. Exactly. She's, she's not definitely not after his money, mm-hmm. right? She's not after being flattered. She just says, nope. Now, this is also, I think... One of the benefits, and we don't want to we don't want to turn ourselves into a bunch of Marys, but I think one of the benefits of reading is this kind of thing that um, Elizabeth goes through this crisis and from the beginning of the book to the end of the book, you can see the slow change of the moral progression that happens that um, by reading it and realizing that this is how change happens. It's like the slow moving of a, of a cruise ship, right? Like it can't turn on a dime. It takes, you know, once you start moving it, it takes forever. And I think that's true of moral improvement that, it's helpful to read these long form novels mm-hmm. where the author is doing this on purpose, wanting to show the character go from an imperfect to a more perfect person. I mean, this is I think this is what Lewis means when he says that Jane Austen is the like a Christian novelist. Mm-hmm. And, you know, she's not explicitly like it wasn't like a roadside preacher like told Elizabeth about sin or that like caused her to, you know, become a better person. Right. But she l- basically realizes that her heart needs to be sanctified. Um, and it sort of takes that moment of realization of your faults for that to start happening. Yes. Um, that's why, and I, and I think this is why um, reading a story like this is really helpful because a, kind of like a catharsis thing, or not catharsis, what is, doesn't Aristotle say in his poetics, like, um, you read stories on these sorts of things so you yourselves don't have to That's live the pain? Yeah, it's for the emotion. Yeah. yeah. Now, of course, Eliz- Jane Austen, I mean, Elizabeth isn't going through, like, immense suffering, but her embarrassment, we get to watch from the outside, we feel how mortified she is, and see that she that the right way that she goes about to make it better and it works out for her yeah. that is a like powerful thing to read about and then to try to think about in your own life okay when have i been called out <laughs> when have i <laughs> been um, when have i been embarrassed or when have i said this is the really strong thing that is in my character that i think i'm really good at sure. because chances are it's probably the blind spot right and this even goes back to, I'm sure we talked about this in your Enneagram episode. I know we probably talked about this in about when we talked about besetting sins, mm-hmm. is that the thing that you're actually you good at as a person, like the thing that uh, uh, some of the, the qualities that are your strengths are going to be those qualities that can be the genesis of your downfall. Yes. Um, um, so the dad has the same kind of witty, cutting personality that elizabeth does which is why he likes elizabeth so much but with the dad we see how that plays out for his detriment he marries the wrong woman he doesn't really raise his kids and his lack of control in his family kind of like he begets this fruit that isn't good um and elizabeth uh, avoids that fate and even 
Um, when she's going to marry Darcy and the dad finds out, the dad has no idea about all this moral change that's happened to Elizabeth. He's like, Elizabeth, don't make the same mistake I did. Don't marry somebody you don't love just because you think it's the right thing to do at the time. And Elizabeth's like, you don't even, dad, you don't even know me. <laughs> you don't even know what you're talking wow. about. And again, it's sort of this painful interaction where you realize that your family doesn't know you. Right. Um, anyway, we could do a whole other podcast on what it means when... Like, can you outgrow your family or, or well, the pain that happens when you realize that your family is not perfect or that they're like better people than your family out mm, there? Yeah. That's a hard lesson. And I think it's a hard lesson for Elizabeth. And then I think the harder lesson is when you realize after that, that you were a little hard on your family and they were pretty great after all. Like you ever have that one? Yeah. Where, yeah when yeah. you're grown up, you're like, my family's a bunch of fools. Right. Yeah. And then I you're, mean, you're like, oh, my parents actually did a pretty good job. Yeah. 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 Really hard life. I don't know. I mean, maybe Elizabeth has that moment, but towards <laughs> the end of the book, she sort of has this like sees her dad for who he is, sees her mom for who he is, and is like, ooh, Darcy's kind of right when he says that we're kind of embarrassing at parties. <laughs> anyway, um, that's uh, that's all I got. I mean, I, I didn't bring in the thing with Hamlet, uh, just maybe if people are just tired of that, less, that loose end. I was going to bring in Hamlet at the in, in, um thinks that by watching a play or by mm-hmm. reading a story – you can have yourself reveal to yourself. He wants to show Claudius the murder. He wants to like show a murder and see if Claudius reacts to it. And I was kind of going to tie that into this idea of if you want yourself revealed to yourself, yes, there are being called out or having these crisis moments, but maybe there can also be if you're reading a story where there's a character who is a lot like you, and you don't like them or whatever. For example, to be quite personal, I look at the dad uh, in the story that who's kind of like sarcastic, but then who's kind of like a withdrawer. And I see, shoot, there are seeds of that kind of personality in myself that if I don't keep a lid on, I could just be like the dude slinging sarcastic comments and is not taking responsibility for those that he's in charge of or needs to be responsible of. Um, just because just the way my personality is, that's, that's, uh, that's a, a pitfall that I know I, I have had and could have. And so, you know, by reading a story of where you see somebody who's like you, maybe you, maybe the story can reveal yourself to yourself and you can pull yourself back from that brink in time so that you don't end up like Lydia or like the dad. You, anyway, that's sort of my the thoughts on it. You want to keep that discussion going in the in between? Yeah, let's, Maybe let's we can continue that discussion yeah. in the uh, in between episode. That'd be cool. Great. Well, this has been Classical Stuff You Should Know. This is Graham, AJ, and Thomas. And you can, if you want to send us an email, reach us at theguys at classicalstuff.net, which also happens to be our website, classicalstuff.net. You can also tweet at us at C-L-S-S-C-A-L stuff. And we are on Patreon if you guys want to patronize us there. And thank you to those listeners who are on Patreon. And I think I think that's it, isn't it? I think so. Well, you guys have yourself an excellent early summer, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. To the listeners. Because it's May. Hey, is it summer already? I mean, early, early summer start. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know the story. Sure. Anyway, thanks, everybody. And we'll see you next time. Ciao. Bye. Bye.